Um, so um, this morning, I want to start um, by kind of talking about something that either you're going you're gonna to go, okay, I can get that, I can resonate with that, I've done that's happened to me before, or you're going to go, why do they keep inviting Kyle to come? Because that's really gross, okay? So um, I want to talk to you this morning to begin about the idea of sunburn, okay? Um, how many of you guys went to the beach this summer? Anybody go to the beach this summer? Okay, awesome. We did too. Um, we go down to the Outer Banks to Kerala and Nags Head and down that way every year and one of our favorite places to go. And um, we actually haven't been there for three or four years, so it was really fun to go. And um, so we're out there and, you know, and of course it was really great weather. It was warm and, um, you know, you, you, you go and you, you put the sun tan stuff on and the, you know, the spray and all that trying to keep yourself from burning. But inevitably, um, I always burn. Okay, and so um, what happens after you burn? You peel. All right. I was going to see, it's funny, some people go, some people say shed, you know? I was going to see, I use the word shed, you guys use peel, so we're going to go with peel, okay? So you peel, right? You begin to peel, and it happens not immediately, but it's a few days later, right? Or maybe weeks. It's been about um, a week and a half since we got back, and just now um, I'm seeing these places that I missed, you know, you think you've got it all, all good to go, and then you find some places that you missed. And for me, it happens to me right down here on my shin. I didn't realize that I was getting burned down there, okay? And so last night, I had some shorts on, and I looked down, and all of this skin <laughs> was peeling, okay? And, and I started to think about that, and I was like, that's interesting because, you know, that's a, it's a natural thing, right? And if you think about and if you read about why it happens, it's, it's pretty simple, right? Um, the skin is dead, okay? The skin has died because it got burned, and it has to be peeled, <laughs> it has to be shed, it has to go away for the healing to begin and for something new to take its place. You know, my skin doesn't just, just go away, it, it peels away the dead parts and then the healthy new skin comes in behind it, right? And if you think about our lives, if you think about our journey with Jesus, all of our lives, we're, we're supposed to be in this process where we're shedding and we're peeling away the things that hold us back from living this full life that Christ has for us, right? And, and we're supposed to continue to do that. It's not like we get to one point where we've made it and we no longer grow anymore. It's, it's a continual process, you know? And I was thinking back to the times in, in my life when I've had all these different burns and the peeling <laughs> that's taking place. And, and it's, 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 it's just this, this thing that matches up. With this idea of what we're supposed to be about as we live our lives and try to pull closer to God. And, and it requires, you know, the shedding of some things, paying less attention to the flesh, right, and more attention to the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And we're going to get into that today because that's where our text takes us. We've been doing this journey through Romans the last couple of weeks. Um, and Romans um, is all about how, how Jesus came to restore a relationship with everyone, with you and with me, and, and how that's available and possible for us um, as we live our lives, okay? And, and Romans has incredible little gems all through it. Um, there's one verse that says this. It says, righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And in other words, um, all of us, all of us can be in this right standing with God. It's available to everyone, and Jesus came to make sure that we, we knew that. And there's another gem that says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? That suggests that there's a freedom that we should enjoy in living God's way. As we go through this process, as we, as we shed the things that hold us back, and the Holy Spirit becomes um, more and more a part of who we are, then we should be able to enjoy that life of living connected and close to God. Um, and that's a really good place to start today as we talk about the verse that we're going to kind of pick apart and, and dive into. Do. It's, it's in Romans 8, okay? Um, and here's what it says. It talks about living in freedom 
from sin. And here's what it says. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 says this. It says, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that um, the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. And so the, the bottom line of this verse is that Jesus came to make it possible for us to no longer be held back by these things that um, push us further away from God, but instead we can follow the Spirit. We can shed, shed, we can get rid of those things that hold us back, and we can follow the Spirit. The flesh doesn't have to control us. The Spirit can dwell within us and move us forward. The freedom that we're supposed to be able to follow is the Spirit of God in us and not our sinful nature, which is also in us, right? There's this battle, right? There's this battle going on where the Spirit is trying to find more room, but we've got the sinful nature that's also in us too, battling back against that. And it reflects itself in many different ways, in the choices that we make, the lies that we live, the things that we say, all kinds of different ways does that pop up um, in our lives. But we have full access to the grace that God has provided for us, um, to, to walk away from sin and to live a life um, that pleases him. But our sin nature works against us. And it can be, and, and here's the thing where it gets tricky, okay? Um, it can't just be about compartmentalizing things because we get good at that. We get good at compartmentalizing our faith. Um, and it's like we, we know um, the parts of a genuine faith, but we're never able to sort of put it all together. That's where we've got to really struggle and continue to battle through. Um, I, let me put it this way. I read an author this week, and here's what he said, and I think you're going to find this really interesting. He said, holiness, this idea, because God says we can be holy. You know, this is what it's all about. God says that we can be holy. And I read that. Every time I see that, I go, wow. <laughs> you know, I think of God as holy, right? But how can, can I be holy? And God says you can, okay? And so this idea of holiness continues to to go through the whole Bible. And, and here's what the author said, okay? He said, um, holiness is something we become by not dancing, drinking, having sex outside marriage, or watching R-rated movies. <laughs> and I thought, wow, if that's all it is, I'm good. You know, I can do that every day of my life. You know, I think I can probably figure that out. But, but it's not that, right? That has really very little to do with it at all. And I was just kind of shocked by that, you know? Um, and, and then there's another, another author that I read. I was kind of thinking through this idea, and this guy's name is Tyler Braun, and he wrote a book about holiness. Um, and here's what he said. He said, um, holiness is not about um, adapting a new behavior. It's not about those things or an activity or discipline or even avoiding certain behaviors. He said, holiness is about new affections and new desires and new motives. So, so the, 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 the desire to know God more deeply, deeper affection for God, those things draw us toward holiness, not just avoiding certain things. Instead, it's about pursuing new things. Um, those things that help us, um, Roman says, um, those things help us pay attention to the Spirit when we pursue and have this desire and, and want to love God more deeply. Those things help us pay attention to the Spirit and no longer pay attention to the flesh. Holiness has to be this positive pursuit. It has to be something that we're going after, that we really desire um, in our lives, not something that you achieve by abstaining from certain behaviors. Um, there's a big, big difference um, in that. Holiness is about positive pursuits, um, not just paying attention to a list of knows. It's a deeper love and a deeper understanding of God that leads to this life change that we all are desiring and want. Um, that's what leads to holiness. And in the book, this guy Braun argues that it's impossible to pursue holiness the other way. Um, that first way where you're just avoiding dancing and drinking and <laughs> whatever it is, all these different things. You can't, you can't achieve holiness in that way. Um, 
you know, we are, we are sort of, we, we, come to, we, we, we come together in worship and, and we try to pursue these ideas together so that, so that we can move forward um, in holiness. But we can't compartmentalize. It doesn't work that way. Um, you can't just get to the point where you go, you know what, I'm a strong follower of Christ enough of the time. <laughs> That's not what God's looking for, Right? Um, he's not looking for us to go, hey, 85%, Kyle, you are awesome, man. 85%, way to go, you know? That's not what he's desiring. He wants it all. He wants 100%. He wants me to be there all the time. And I can only get there by knowing him more, loving him more, and desiring him more. I can make these choices on the side that aren't bad, but that's not going to draw me into loving him more. That's just a behavior. Okay, um, sometimes we let ourselves off the hook when we are engaged in sin, right? And we don't pursue holiness because we just go, well, God's going to forgive me. That's one way we look at it. We go, God's going to forgive me, so I'm just going to let myself off the hook. You know, even like it's before, during, and after the thing that we know is pulling us away from God. Um, and so we just go, well, sin doesn't really matter because God's going to let me off the hook. Sometimes we think of things that way. Um, because God's forgiven the sin. There's really no compelling reason for us to avoid it, right? Other times we sin um, in the same way so often that we forget that it's pulling us away from God. We forget that that sin is pulling us away from God. And once we go there, um, we feel like we're pretty much home free because the sin is no longer a burden. You know, it doesn't even affect us anymore. It's so common, and we just forget about it. Or maybe, maybe think of it this way. Um, we focus on our freedom in Christ. You know, we sing about that and we talk about that. But I think we can mistakenly go too far and say, well, um, I've got that freedom, so it allows me to do things that I know God would not really like, um, but he doesn't want me to be legalistic about stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So we find all these excuses to sort of um, dabble um, into things of the flesh instead of things of the Spirit. But the big problem of thinking this way is that when we, um, we see sin that's something that's neutral, something that's not for us or against us, okay, um, we just start to see that as a reality of life. But God says, no, it's really different than that, you know? God says, you can, you can have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And when we love and follow Jesus and understand that holiness is about new affections and these, these positive pursuits, we understand um, that there is a cost and that the cost is important for us to bear. We need to feel it to know that we're in the right track, okay? Um, and we need to know in our own hearts that we've given, <laughs> we've given God more than 85%, that we've given him, you know, everything. Um, if you have a Bible this morning, I want you to grab it and open it up. If not, we're going to put some of these things um, up on the screen. But we're going to look um, at a few companion verses that I think are super helpful. We're going to look in the book of 1 Peter, okay, um, chapter 1. And we're going to spend a little bit of time um, in that this morning. And as you get there, I want to continue um, a little bit on that last thought. Um, holiness is hard, <laughs> okay? Holiness <laughs> costs us something, right? Holiness is hard. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be easy, right? It requires um, us to say to Christ, you know, I want <laughs> to change my life. And, and here's what I want for myself. Um, and sometimes that could be a really scary thing because that's a, that's a giving over of control, you know? That's a complete surrender, which is what God's looking for. And that can be scary, you know. That could be really, that could be tough, all right. Um, and, and there's a couple of other things that you have to understand that if you're going to do that, that seem really scary, but understand these ideas, okay. You have to understand that even though um, you want it, you can fail, right. <laughs> all of us have failed. All of us fail from time to time. You know, we can fail, but we can't let that stop us. We have to understand that um, you have to break free from some things in order to pursue holiness. There's some things that we allow to hold us back. Our past, current decisions that we're making, things that are happening, but we have to break free of that in order to move toward 
holiness. We have to understand that pursuing holiness pushes you way outside of your comfort zone. You know, holiness isn't, if it was really easy and we could just achieve it, then it wouldn't need to push us anywhere. But it's not easy. It's hard. It pushes us into areas that we're not ready for sometimes. Okay? Um, and all of those things and more come with holiness, which is why um, it's become sort of a distorted term. It's not easy. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> okay? It's hard, but it's worth it. Okay? Um, look at um, 1 Peter with me. All right? Look at 1 Peter. It says, um, 1 Peter 1, uh, <laughs> I was going to translate, but I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't get it. Um, okay, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and then 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Okay, so first one is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It says this, it says, God the Father knew you. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is a big, powerful statement, isn't it? <laughs> that, is, that is something that, um, if you ever, you know, I think sometimes we wonder about, does God care about me? Does God see me? Who does He think I am? Where, where do I fall in this kingdom of God? <laughs> wow, there it is, right? That is a big statement about who we can be and who we can, what we can live into, okay? And then 15 and 16 says this, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. <laughs> so here's this incredible verse of, of God showing us just exactly who we are and our value in his kingdom and who, how much he loves us. And then he says, but go with me on this. <laughs> Move forward with me on this, okay? Because you're holy, you must be holy because I'm holy, okay? And, and you've got to make everything you do about holiness. Easy or hard? Hard. <laughs> Thank you for being with me on that, okay? It's okay that some stuff is hard, right? All right, so Peter says our way to holiness and our ability to be free from sin is through what Jesus did for us on the cross, okay? Jesus made it possible for us to pursue holiness, okay? And holiness matters because it's, um, it's the sin that holds us back, right? It messes up our relationship and crushes us, all right? Listen to this, this quote. Um, it's a guy named Tim Keller. Maybe you've read some of his books. He said, when God poured out his justice on Christ, he was not only destroying his son, but destroying the barrier between himself and us. How amazing. <laughs> the more God vented his holiness on Jesus, the more he was venting his love for us. Holiness leads us to this true life, and it's this mark of God's grace um, and work in our lives. We show that we are God's followers when we show that we're becoming holy. You know, we're supposed to show who God is in this world. We're supposed to reflect um, who he is. We're made in his image. <laughs> and so when we begin to live out of holiness, we, we begin to reflect that, and people see that around us. And holiness leads us to a true life, the life that we were destined for, the life that we were made for, the way that God has really put us together. It's the mark of God's grace on our word, on, our, on, on us and in this world. And we show that we're God's followers when we become more and more holy. He desires to make us more and more like him. And often that's worked out when we declare um, that we want God to do this, that we want this, you know, this new life. And pursuing that life is going to be difficult, okay? Um, holiness requires difficulty. <laughs> holiness requires a lot of us, okay? And, and while that's true, I want you to understand what some of the benefits are. I want to talk through some of those benefits today. 
um, and then talk again about um, some ways that we can practically do this every day because um, sometimes I think we get lost in this, this bigness of holiness. What does that mean? How can we really pursue that? So think about these things with me. Um, if we're going to pursue holiness, it's going to be hard. It's going to require a lot of work. Okay, it's going to change us and move us and push us all kinds of places that um, are going to be uncomfortable. However, it means a couple of things. One, it means a new life of freedom. Okay, a new life of freedom. Um, I started today talking about sunburns in the beach, and now I want to talk about snow. Okay, um, all of you have probably lived in this area long enough to know that we can either get a million inches of snow, and it's horrible, or we get nothing, right? I prefer the million inches because at least then I can't leave the house and all I have to do is watch Netflix, okay? So I'm good, right? Okay, um, so a couple of years ago, we had one of those, right? We had a big one. And um, I happened to be having to be in the city in D.C. when I knew it was coming, but I had to be in the city anyway. And it got so bad that I couldn't get out, okay? Couldn't get out. And so I had to get a hotel room in D.C. for $10 million, right? You know how much it costs, right, to get a hotel room in the city. It's so expensive. So I'm like, I can't, you know, I have a four-wheel drive. And I'm just telling my wife, I'm like, I'm just, she's like, no, don't. I'm like, I can make it. Four-wheel drive, you know? I am from Indiana. We have snow in July. It's no problem. I can just plow right through it, right? She's like, no, no, no. So one night I get this hotel room, right? Well, the problem was that it just kept snowing. And the next morning, it was even worse, right? To where even I was like, yeah, I can't make it home. Yeah, four-wheel drive doesn't matter. I, you know, not going to happen, right? So one night turns into two nights at $10 million, right? So I'm like, oh, man, this is, I do not want to stay in the city in a hotel room again, right? So finally, um, the next morning, I got up. And, you know, it had begun to melt. It was above freezing and all that. And I thought, I, no way. I, first of all, I, they're going to kick me out because my American Express card is maxed out. There's no more room on this card for hotel rooms. I got to get out of here, right? So I get in the four-wheel drive, and I start heading from northwest D.C. out to Centerville, where I live, out 66 in Fairfax County, right? So I'm driving, 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 driving. And, you know, there's a few little hard spots here and there, but I'm, I'm making it over, and I'm getting there, and I get all the way home, okay, all the way to the left turn on my street, all right, to the left turn on my street, and the roads are not great, but I have a four-wheel drive, and I'm from so it doesn't matter, right? So here I go. I'm like, I'm go I, at this point, I've been, you know, take a long time to get out. I'm like, I am getting to my house, right? So there's a pretty big berm of snow, and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> right up into it, boom, locked, stuck, dead. Here's my car in the middle of the road blocking all progress in the world with a million feet of snow all around it, right? I was dead in the water, stuck, right? And I'm sitting there, and so I'm like, oh, man. So I can't just leave it there, right? I just can't leave it. So I get out. I have a shovel on the back. So I start trying to dig this thing. I'm digging, 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 trying to shovel this thing out. And I'm not kidding you. This guy who lives across the street, he comes out. He's got on shorts and a T-shirt with snow boots and a shovel. So, and I'm like, I don't even ask at this point because I just want to be free from this situation, you know. I don't even ask. So he's digging. I'm digging. I'm digging. It's like 30, 40 minutes because I had really got myself stuck in there really bad. But finally, finally, you know, I dug myself out and, and, I, and I could get out and, and I never did drive down to my house. Couldn't make it that far. Had to back up and find just some place to park because there was no way I was getting down the road. But man, after the whole weekend of all that. It just felt good, right, to be free of that situation and move forward. And I'm thinking about times in my own life when, um, when I've had to walk through some stuff that I didn't love, you know, that, that was hard. And, and, you, and, the time is, and, and in the times that you go through that stuff, you're thinking, well, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why, why aren't you making this easy for me? Why have you not pulled me through this? Why is this situation still there? Why do I have to deal with this? 
and you just want to be free of it. And then finally you are, right? And sometimes it's this really amazing, awesome feeling where you go, God, I really understand now what you were doing there, and I'm so much better on the other side of that. And, and you can praise him for it, right? Then sometimes it doesn't quite feel that way. We are still kind of wondering, like, well, that was really hard. <laughs> I'm not really sure why I had to walk through that. But I still trust <laughs> that God was in it and that he was moving me forward and there was a reason. And so, long and short of it, <laughs> is that pursuing holiness brings us to this point where we are changed and we move forward, you know, and we find new freedom because of what God has done. And, and all the things that go around it are, are worth it, okay? The Bible says a new life of freedom for us is freedom from living the world's way, freedom to pursue holiness, okay? Um, there's a great verse that talks about this um, in Galatians. It says, I'm shocked that you're turning away so soon from God, who in his love and mercy called you to share the eternal life he gives through Christ. You're already following a different way that pretends to be good news, but, there's not, but, there, but there is no good news at all. You are being fooled. It's this verse of saying, look, look, um, when, when, when God shows you freedom after walking through something, hang on to that. <laughs> you know, don't be pulled away so quickly in, in a bad direction again. Remember those times and, and live in that, okay? Um, here's another really um, amazing part of pursuing holiness and why it's worth it. This new life, it means a release from emptiness, you know, a release from emptiness. And there's a verse in 1 Peter that says, God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. Um, this ransom is Jesus, you know. Jesus was the ransom that was paid so that we can have um, a full life, a life of connection, a life of connection to God and to others and, and to the world that God created and to find our place in it. And that takes away the emptiness, you know, when we, when we begin to realize that and begin to own that and begin to love that and want that. Another thing, a new life means hope for every single day. Hope for every single day. You know, um, every single person in this room, we've, we've had days where we needed hope. We've had days where we've wondered, how, is, how can this be my life? <laughs> how can this be where I'm at? Or, or we have someone in our lives where there's some darkness, and, and we're walking through that with them, and it really hurts, right? And we say, how can this be? And we need hope. And we find that um, when we pursue holiness, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians that says, we have this treasure from God, hope, but we are like jars of clay that hold the treasure, you know? Um, when, I, when I became a dad, um, something happened to me where I see commercials about little kids and I just cry. <laughs> something happens, you know? And, and that, sort of, um, that sort of is that way, um, in, in the beginning when you become a dad and, you know, it's just this emotional thing and you want to protect your kids and all that kind of stuff. And then it sort of, it sort of goes away, you know, a little bit as they grow up. And then I've, underst and I've just understood recently how that all comes full circle for me because um, my son, my oldest son, is now in college. And he has gone off, um, this is his second year. And so um, when he leaves, <laughs> you know, I think, well, he's, a, he's a pretty much a grown man. He's good. I don't, need to, I don't need to worry about that or <laughs> be upset by that. But he left on Wednesday, and I cried again. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, I just cried again. Um, um, you know, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes when we're going through hard stuff, we can bounce back. <laughs> and sometimes it's harder to bounce back, right? And um, we've always got to hang on to this hope that, that God gives us. You know, when we have hope, um, when, 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 when challenging things are coming along, then we know we can move forward, right? And pursuing holiness, even though it's hard, gives us that hope, okay? Um, and so those are, the, those are the things, those three little things are the things why I think it's really worth it 
you know, for us to pursue holiness, you know. Um, and, and now I want to just, just switch gears for a second. And I don't usually like to, like, give a big list of stuff to do, but I'm going to give you a big list of stuff to do, okay? Um, because sometimes I think when we talk about these things, I never know, and, and it's the same way with me when I hear somebody talk about this. I'm like, well, that sounds great for you, but that doesn't work for me. You know, because that's not how I live my life, or that's not what's happening with me or whatever. And so I want to give you this, this, this pretty long list of these things that we can do and these things that we can celebrate um, because that will pull us into holiness, because I don't know which one might work for you, you know? And so I just want to give them to you. I just want you to think about these things, because I've tried to practice all of these at different times, um, and, and they can all <laughs> pull us toward holiness, but maybe one works for you better than the other, okay? So here's one. Um, it's this idea of thanking God for his presence in your life, you know, thanking him for his presence. You know, sometimes we just mumble through life and we kind of rumble and we move and we move forward. And it's not that we don't love God, but we don't really stop <laughs> and celebrate, you know, what he's done to this point. And that's really important, you know, because because that helps us to understand, you know, the process and 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 who we are and how we're moving forward in him. And so um, it's, this, it's, it's this idea of stopping and thanking God for um, his presence in our life. Um, there's a verse in 1 Peter that says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him, now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, <laughs> you know? And so probably you've had these moments in life where you've just been like, God, you are so good. And he's calling upon us to recall those things from time to time, to not forget that he's there and we want to give him that glory, okay? So thanking God for his presence can pull us toward holiness. Um, showing God and his ways to those around us, that can move us toward holiness. Showing God his ways to around us. You know, every one of us has family and friends who are living um, lives that are disconnected from God. And it can be really hard <laughs> to, to intervene in that and try to show them um, why you have this hope in Jesus. But God's calling upon us to do that, you know. Sometimes it means a direct conversation. Sometimes it simply means living a life that can be seen. And people begin to wonder, what's the difference in that person? Why are they able to navigate stuff that I can't navigate? What is that about? It's about showing others God's way. Um, and, and, and that helps us move towards holiness. Um, there's another one that it sounds big, but it's, it's, really, it's, it's really important. It's choosing God's way every day. Choosing God's way every day. You know, being in a relationship with God requires effort, as we've been talking about a lot this morning. Every day, you know, you have to kind of get up and make that choice. You know, make that choice if you're going to live God's way or your way. You know, is it going to be God's way or is it going to be your way? Um, the book of Hebrews talks about it. It says, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. <laughs> work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. It's about a practicing these things about practicing the things of God and loving them so much that you want to practice them, okay? Here's a couple more. Um, develop a love for the Word of God. You know, developing a love for the Word of God. Um, you know, the Bible talks about how um, it's babies crave milk, and, and we do too. You know, it says, um, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, and that's, that's the Word. You know, that's, that's what it is. That's what he's talking about there. And so, you know, the, the more that we can do that, I was so impressed. My son, um, who uh, in high school lived a pretty, pretty good Christian life, you know, um, high school kids, right? <laughs> Sometimes, you never know. But um, he, when he went to college, you know, he really, that be, I think, you know, he began to flourish in new ways. 
because it was different, and he had to figure out whether that was real for him, and it became really real for him. And when he came home this year, he, you know, they, they get out of school in May, and so he started a 90-day read through the entire Bible in 90 days, okay? I don't know if you've ever done that, or maybe you've done through the, I've done the one through the year, you know, I'm like, I can handle that, 90 days, ah, I don't know, but he did it, you know, he started in May, and he finished when we were at the beach getting sunburned, and, um, but it was, I thought it was, it was incredible, you know, to, to, and I was like, I was, I, he couldn't answer this question, I was like, well, so, <laughs> you just read the whole, Carson, you just read the whole Bible, what are you going to do now, I'm going to Disney World, no, you know, it's like, I wanted to, I, I was hoping that he would have like this profound, he was like, well, God, or God, Dad, what I've learned is that blah, blah, blah. And he was like, I have to get back to you on that. <laughs> because, you know, you, you're taking in all of that in 90 days. But, you know, um, it's, it's, it's steeping yourself in it in whatever way works for you. <laughs> okay, that clearly will pull you toward holiness, all right? Um, here's another one. Give yourself to the process of renewing your mind according to the Scriptures. You know, we're in Romans. And Romans has this incredibly famous verse of, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <laughs> you know, and, and Scripture talks a lot about how the way that we think is not how God thinks. And the key <laughs> to holiness and the key to some of these things is to begin to think about things the way that God thinks about things. Wow. <laughs> And often that's not the way we think about it, right? They're transforming by the renewing of our minds and opening up our minds to the possibility that there's a different and better way to think about things, okay? Um, another one is this. Develop your love relationship with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but what that means for me is worship through song. <laughs> you know, um, um, in my entire ministry as a pastor, um, one of the things that's been a tremendous value for me, I work with students. I'm the youth pastor, and so I work with middle school and high school kids. But um, in, our, in our church service that we have for students, worship is huge. <laughs> we just go at it in the best way that we can that's kid-friendly, student-friendly. Um, and it's, it's, it's part of, because for me, I don't even want to try to even come up and preach and talk about God with you guys or with our students if I haven't worshiped through song, you know, it just puts me in the right spot, you know, and I need it, and, and I know that there's 10 million different kinds of worship styles, I don't care whatever style works for you, <laughs> you know, worship through song, you know, maybe for you, that's important, but that draws me toward God, you know, and that can draw you toward God. Um, two more, okay, um, one is ask people you know and trust to hold you accountable, <laughs> Ask people you know and trust to hold you accountable. I want to say a real quick word. You guys have paid attention to the world, right? <laughs> Pay attention to what's going on in the world and to what's going on in the church world. So many of those problems would be <laughs> cut off if there was anybody <laughs> allowing them to ask them a question, right? And I just, you know, I hate when I see stuff <laughs> Because it just hurts the whole church, no matter what branch of it is. <laughs> of it is, you know, I just think, where's you know, there's no accountability on that. And if there's any account, if there's any accountability, you know, it helps people to live better lives. And you know, if you can find somebody that you trust who you can talk to about your stuff, and they can hold you accountable to that, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Okay. And the final one is this. Um, um, you know, we just talked, I just spent quite a bit of time about talking about reading through Scripture, and it's so important and all that. But sometimes, um, you know, you read through Scripture and, and maybe don't quite understand exactly what it means, or there's so much to ingest that you're not sure where to start or whatever it is. You know, don't be shy about um, reading some other things, you know, that are spiritually based. You know, so a mom asked me the other night, they've got seventh grader coming into our ministry, and she's like, so... Um, this, this kid, Henry, he likes to, he reads, he li he'll read the Bible, but, you know, what, what are some other stuff that I could get him to read <laughs> or look at that might be helpful? And I was like, for a second, I kind of blanked out, and then I thought about my own kids. Like, um, when Bennett was about that grade, about that age, um, he had the same issues, and I gave him the, uh, the Tim Tebow autobiography. 
Okay, Tim Tebow seems like a pretty solid guy, you know, follower of Jesus. And when Bennett actually read that, <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure he was going to read the Bible, but he did read the Tim Tebow book, you know. And some of this stuff got reinforced, right? And so find things that reinforce <laughs> Scripture for you, devotionals, um, books by folks that you admire who are devoted followers of Jesus. Finding those things is really helpful um, in pursuing holiness, all right? Um, I don't know, you know, which or if any of those work for you. I hope they do. I hope they're helpful. I've tried to pursue many of those myself. Um, I think the key is <laughs> um, understanding that the move toward holiness is a difficult one, but it's so worth it. And you've got this God of the universe who's cheering you on and saying, you can be holy. <laughs> and you can live a life after me. You can pursue me. <laughs> and you can show that to the world. Right? I want to pray for you guys um, as the band continue, comes up and is going to lead us in a little time of worship. But I just want to pray for you um, as we finish our time this morning. God, thanks for letting us be in this place. And um, Lord... Help us to put our hearts in the right spot that we may find new and amazing ways to love you. <laughs> Lord, help us to move toward holiness even when it's hard. Help us move through the things that are difficult. Show us, God, in your mercy. Show us, God, in your mercy why we have to walk through some of these things. Help us to move forward. God, we love you for who you are. Thank you for loving us and showing us the way. And we pray that your spirit would dwell in our hearts. We thank you. We love you. We lift up all these things. And we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.